The presentation of Toledo Stories is made possible in part by Key Bank, celebrating the strength of our region's history and supporting the promise of its future. Key Bank, achieve anything. And by the generous financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Timothy Messer Cruz from the University of Toledo. On this episode of Toledo Stories, we present Cornerstones, the Polish in Toledo, which originally aired in 1997 on WGTE. Many people struggled to come to America, but perhaps no other immigrant to Toledo worked as hard as Tofil Sadowski to get here. In 1863, Sadowski was a 24-year-old newlywed, just beginning life on a small farm near Skulsk in Russian-controlled Poland. But that year, a rebellion against Russian occupation broke out, and Sadowski left his farm and his bride to join a band of guerrillas. Before they had time to train as a unit, they were attacked and lost a tenth of their men. The survivors regrouped in a forest and were surrounded and beset by wave after wave of Russian assaults. They held out for three days, longer than their ammunition. Sadowski was wounded, but eluded his pursuers and made it back to his farm. Once he healed, he rejoined the rebels and fought in the Battle of Lubertov, where one-fourth of his brigade was killed. Wounded again, this time Sadowski was captured and was sentenced to 12 years at hard labor in Siberia. Three years later, in a camp near Lake Baikal, Sadowski and 700 Polish prisoners staged a revolt, which was quickly put down, and Sadowski was sent to the feared prison at Kerry, a word that translates as punishment. He spent seven years in that hole, then another nine in a camp deep in the Irkuki Desert. Then, in 1882, Sadowski was released on the promise that he never returned to Poland. Sadowski ignored these conditions and began a long walk westward, hundreds upon hundreds of miles to the Prussian border. He hid out in forests and sewers to avoid border patrols. Once across, he sent a letter to the wife he had not seen in 17 years and instructed her to sell the farm and come with him to America. Sadowski would finally arrive in Toledo around 1890, where he set up a clothing shop on the corner of LaGrange and Hausman. At the end of the program, I'll show you how you can learn more about the history of the Polish community in Toledo as I speak with Jim Marshall, director of the local history center at the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. And we'll share some rare images from the WGTE film and video archives. And now, Toledo Stories presents Cornerstones, the Polish in Toledo. It was a good neighborhood to grow up in. It was um, a neighborhood that gave you a sense of belonging because almost everybody was Polish and we all enjoyed the same traditions and culture. This is where I started my business. This is where I uh, got married in this neighborhood and was there for a long, long time. I wouldn't change it for the world. There was always a very strong sense of pride in the neighborhood. Pride in uh, the business community, the churches, uh, just in general. And that, that stemmed, I think, from a sense of belonging and a, a sense of uh, one generation to the next. You know, on Sunday mornings you'd go along here, you'd think you were on Fifth Avenue in New York. It was just crowded and, and, and people, it seemed that everybody was happy. They came to Toledo from Poland's cities and farms, sometimes entire villages at a time. Some sought riches, others wanted only a fresh start in a land of plenty. They built homes and churches, filled their neighborhoods with young families and new businesses, and formed a community while building a city. The first Poles to arrive in this area came in the 1870s, fleeing their occupied country and seeking a place that felt like home. Legends claim the frontier town of Vistula, one of the towns that later became Toledo, 
was named after a river in Poland by an early immigrant who said the area reminded him of home. Uh, there were probably three great revolutionary movements at the end of the 18th century that could have succeeded in creating democratic societies on their own. The United States, France, and Poland. The Polish experiment failed uh, because of the invasion of its neighbors. Russia, Austria, and, and Prussia by 1795 partitioned Poland and removed what was once the largest state in Europe from the map. It's so over 123 years, Poland ceased to exist. The earliest settlers here came from Prussian Poland. The Prussian government instituted programs to resettle ethnic Germans into Polish lands. And so um, Polish settlers or Polish villagers were bought out. They sold their lands. And once they sold their lands, then they came here and they had nothing to go back to. And so they formed kind of the nucleus of the of what we think of as American Polonian communities. And later, the settlers came from the Russian partition and from the Austria-Hungarian partition. America must have looked promising to the Poles, pressed hard by turmoil at home. But when they arrived, many found the land of opportunity offered easy money and not much else. And once they had enough money to make a better life at home, they returned to Poland. Although most people don't think of it this way. They think of, of people immigrating and finding freedom and, you know, somehow finding the American dream here and then and, uh, and settling down and leaving the old world behind. Probably for the Poles, close to half of the total immigration went back to Poland. But when they came back, they told stories. They came back with money to buy a, a cow, a, a new farm, uh, a better house, and their neighbors said, well, maybe we should go too, because uh, uh, John or Joe has, has done very well there. And uh, so even if the man didn't stay in America, he was a, a walking, living advertisement for success in America. The Poles who came to Toledo made their homes near the city's German neighborhoods and set about finding work. At the time of immigration, they tended to settle together. I mean, of course it made sense. They needed to live someplace w that was cheap, where people could speak their language, where they could communicate, where they could get a room, um, where, where they could meet their daily needs without having to speak another language, and, um, and where they had a sense of community, where they felt they could fit in. No, that helped, you know, uh, people, because those, they didn't speak English at all. They uh, could eventually, you know, find uh, information or, for example, jobs and so on, talking to the people, or they could, they could um, uh, you know, also buy what they needed, you know, in the stores uh, uh, just using Polish. So that helped uh, very, very much. Toledo's Poles followed a path laid by Germans and Irish immigrants before them and took the jobs they left behind the kind of work America traditionally reserved for its newest immigrants. Dirty, dangerous, and hard. In Detroit, in Chicago, in Cleveland, uh, Toledo, Milwaukee, the uh, uh, Poles are following German migrants, and they move into many of the same occupations, uh, at first as unskilled workers, but then into uh, foundries, into uh, small metal work, in shops that were, were flourishing throughout the Midwest, carriage, carriage works and the like. My father worked at the, on the railroad, my brothers worked at the railroad, and most of the people I know either dug ditches, worked the sewers, or worked in, in these heavy factories. And that's all they could get at that time. No education, couldn't speak the English language. The major employer for the Poles in the early 20th century was Willis Overland, which later becomes Jeep, later American Motors. Um, that was the employer. Everybody, I'm sure everybody in their family had somebody who worked for Willis Overland. Although the work was difficult, the Poles who found jobs at Willis Overland and its suppliers considered themselves lucky. They knew that their language and even the ways they spelled their names could be enough to deny them work in those early days. Even knowing some German, which probably got them a job, 
Um, there probably was enough discrimination that they were identified as Poles, and so they weren't allowed to advance in the ranks. I remember my Uncle Stanley uh, telling me that uh, his name was Stan Chichinsky, and when he went to apply for a job, that he was told that he would not get the job because of his Polish name. And so he changed his name on the application to Stanley Fandel. That was the name of a friend of his. And later, he legally changed his name to Stan Fandel. And incidentally, he did get that job. They gritted their teeth and did the work. And with the money they earned in the factories and foundries of Toledo, they built homes and neighborhoods and laid the foundations of a new life. Then, they began to look for God in America. The immigrants who came always had to find God. Gods are very local. Uh, most of them had no experience outside of their own village. And one of the things you read in immigrant letters, as the people write back, uh, from the old country to, uh, rather, from the old country to the immigrants, and they say, is God there? Do you have churches? Do you have synagogues? Uh, are the services the same? Because their, their experience was usually fairly limited. So one of the things they had to do is recreate uh, the, the religious experience. Until the diocese approved the construction of a church just for Toledo's Polish Catholics, God was in the German-speaking parishes of St. Mary's and Saints Peter and Paul. That all changed when they built St. Hedwig's. When they first were looking for uh, property for the church, they had considered the area around the art museum. But for one reason or another, the land wasn't appropriate and um, so the decision was made to build here. The idea being that if they built there, it would be central to both the north and the south ends, and there would be a common meeting place, common meeting ground. But since that didn't work out, um, the Grain Street became settled. And then, um, in turn, by the same priest, Father Lewandowski, St. Anthony's was founded, and that area developed also. Each church that the Poles built, St. Hedwig's, St. Anthony's on Nebraska, St. Adelbert on northern LaGrange Street, and three churches in South Toledo, St. Stanislaus, Nativity, and St. Hyacinth anchored a community and said to Toledo that the Poles planned to stay. I don't think you can overestimate the importance of the church. Um, a Polish community was not a community until it had built a church. And the sacrifices that went into the creation of these enormous, um, magnificent edifices um, for the people mortgaged their homes to give money for the church. Um, I think that this was a symbol for them of their, their having a place. One of the things I think is very important to understand is that ethnicity is the creation of a culture that allows you to be at home in the new society. When they became ethnic, they became American. When they built those churches, they were creating the stone and mortar root that tied them to the soil of the new world. It means they were going to stay. By 1882, Toledo's Poles had pretty well settled down in two neighborhoods, one around St. Anthony's near Nebraska and Junction, the other around St. Hedwig's on LaGrange, or as they called it, La Grinca. Somewhere along the line, and I don't know exactly when, there was this uh, would-be polonization of the name LaGrange so that it became known as La Grinca. In La Grinca, the Poles built a home that had everything they needed. You would never had to leave the community to, to satisfy your needs. There were businesses and, and entertainment facilities and social activities and so on within the confines of the community that uh, you never had to go out of it if you didn't choose to. Grocery stores, barber shops, bakeries, dry goods stores, hardware, dry cleaners, uh, drug stores. I mean, everything was right in the neighborhood. Uh, you, it was right there. I mean, it was, uh, it was one big mall, except that it was all down blocks of the neighborhood. The people that ran these businesses were the same people that you knew when you went to church or you, you saw walking down the street. 
and you didn't think about going to a business that was a stranger's business. But it wasn't all business. The Ohio Theater offered stage acts and movies, and there was music on almost every corner. Most of the bars would have little polka bands. My God, you go down up and down the Green Street, and I bet there were half a dozen polka uh, bands playing in the different bars along the way. Across town, the streets around St. Anthony's, bordering the German enclave of Lynx Hill, became known as Kuschwanz. At the time, it marked the very outskirts of the city. I actually grew up, uh, my brother and I, in the Reynolds Corners area, right off of Door Street, which used to be blueberry country. And my father would come from uh, his home parish, which was St. Anthony's, and from Vance Street, where he grew up, and my mother uh, grew up on Lucas Street uh, in that general area. They called it Kuschwanz. And my dad used to run out to the country, pick blueberries, and then he'd find his way back to where he lived by the steeple on the top of St. Anthony's. The Polish called it Kroviogon, but the German name stuck. Kuschwanz. It means cow's tail. We don't know where it originated. We have uh, English references and police blotters back to maybe 1881. That's the first primary source. Um, so it may have been the English speakers array referring to that as the cow's tail direction of town, the tail end of the city. Uh, it may have been a German expression. It may have been originally cut out of the and later translated into German. More people know it by the German name Kuschwanz. It seemed to have a city atmosphere because it was uh, quite sophisticated in many ways because of all the merchants there in the stores and uh, the ability to, uh, to get what you needed. And then it may be in some instances it had a little bit of a farm atmosphere because you could walk down the street and maybe see somebody who had a big yard was raising chickens and ducks and maybe rabbits. So that gave it kind of a, a farm flavor, I think. As the century turned, Kuschwanz and Lagrinka flourished. And as they grew, they nurtured small businesses that to this day are what Toledo's Poles remember best about the neighborhoods. It was a great place to live because uh, everything was so convenient. You had the grocery stores there, the butcher, the baker, like Daylight Bakery, with it's a wonderful rye bread, and the best pumpkin pie that I have not eaten since then. Many people were able to walk to their place of employment. Uh, most people didn't have a car and didn't need one because everything you needed for daily living was there. Most people knew the captor name because my father's oldest brother, Martin, um, and their middle brother, Pete, ran a family market right on Junction Avenue. And the question I have been asked the most in my political career is Marcy, was it your family that owned the store on Junction Avenue? My grandfather opened during Prohibition um, as a malt and cigar shop. It was a pool room, a bar and pool room, on, from about 1903, I believe, to about 1919, 1920. At that time, the Opiaka Savings and Loan um, moved in, and that was a, a bank, of course. It operated from the early 20s up until the Great Depression. In 1932, when my grandfather did open Tom's Carry Out, um, some Polish people, thinking that the bank had reopened, stopped in with their bank books, demanding their money to my grandfather. And he had to explain that he was not in the banking business that he was selling uh, groceries and uh, malt and cigars, and, but he couldn't do anything about the Great Depression, unfortunately. <laughs> Even in the depths of the Depression, the neighborhoods were able to support local merchants, quite a few of them, especially grocers. We used to have as many as three on the corner grocery stores, three, and they were all doing business. You know, you maybe didn't get rich, but I mean, you kept on paying your bills and you stayed in business. In our corner here, we had two, one here and one across the street. And the fella that 
had that one across the street, he always told everybody in the neighborhood that he's going to knock us out of business. And here we are. We are here. Everybody's gone, but we're still here. We had a little place like a little town here. We didn't have to go downtown unless it was something special. Well, we'd get all dressed up because we were going downtown. But like this, we had everything and anything you wanted in the neighborhood. Of course, sometimes the corner grocer wasn't above a quick trip downtown to pick up tricks to keep his customers happy. When some customers came and wanted certain kind of cuts of meat, which he didn't know, my dad would tell him, well, I don't have it here now, but I'll get it for tomorrow. So he turned around, he went down the old streetcar to Titsy's and walk around their meat department, and after he's seen what it was, then he asked one of the butchers there, how did, where that, that, does that come from? What piece of meat? So they told him, and then he came home and he knew. So when the customer came back the next day for it, he, he had it for her because he knew where it came from. That little extra effort made all the difference when it came to keeping customers. That and a willingness to let them run a tab. You were able to take things and not pay for them, and they would say, you put it on the book. That was an expression that you used. And all it was was a little book that you could buy in the five and dime in those days. And it had a carbon copy. And whatever you purchased, they would mark down as to how much you owed. And at the end of the week, your mother went and paid the bill. And then you got a bag of candy from the grocery. We were very happy. We made sure we went to the grocery store with her on that day. We were very happy. We made sure we went to the... Well, my father was from um, uh, the Nebraska Avenue area, and my mother was from the LaGrange Street area from uh, St. Adalbert's. Of course, uh, they didn't have cars at that time, but uh, Dad used to take the streetcar to uh, visit Mom, and uh, at that time there was a streetcar line down Nebraska Avenue to the downtown area, and then it would go up LaGrange Street. And the, the joke uh, was that it was the longest streetcar line in the world, from pole to pole. Uh, linking actually the two Polish neighborhoods of Toledo. That old joke has roots in the truth. They were both Polish neighborhoods, part of the same small city. But Lagrinka and Kuschwanz sometimes seemed worlds apart. There used to be friction, I guess, between the fellas and the girls when they used to come from uh, Lagrange Street to see a girl on Junction Avenue. All the fellow would should have been able to run pretty fast because they was after him. <laughs> and it was the same thing if a Junction Avenue fellow went to LaGrange Street to see a girl that was the same thing down there, they got after him. The fact that a, a Paul was from that community rather than ours was a fact that uh, didn't escape note and didn't escape relatively early note. Uh, in conversation of, uh, about that person or, or in a meeting with that person. It, it was one of the um, principal means of identification when uh, meeting someone uh, of Polish ancestry. Where, where is the person from? Or as the idiom was, who are they from home? Between the neighborhoods, there could be quite a competition over girls and over even more important things. Rivalry, yeah. Sports, oh yeah, there were some fierce basketball games here at old St. Anthony's Hall upstairs. Used to have a packed house there. They had the old St. Hedwig's YMA, and they had some great athletes there, too, and we had some great athletes, too. That was the rivalry that I remember. We heard about it in the 1950s uh, growing up. I think those people that remember it from the 1930s and 40s experienced the most rivalry between the two neighborhoods that they couldn't date in the neighborhoods and there'd be gangs to, to protect the girls from the neighborhood or whatever. Um, but otherwise, I think that the rivalry is pretty a, a natural thing between any parish, any neighborhood or whatever, neighboring parishes competing or bragging about theirs being better or, or larger or whatever. Friendly competition aside, Lagrinka and Kuschfans were tight-knit communities. Neighbors there took care of each other, shared everything, and worked and played hard together. People were so darn helpful. Uh, uh, when, whenever anybody wanted to, uh, had some 
shorts to do around like painting. You never had to worry about that. There'd be a, a whole gang of people would come in with paint brushes. You'd furnish the paint. In one day, they practically painted the whole house. And then, of course, they reciprocated. Everybody helped one another in those days. In my home on Hamilton, there, we had a peak at the uh, attic with a window at each end. So I took these speakers and mounted them in the windows. And, uh, played the radio and let everybody enjoy it, especially in the summertime. They'd all be out on their porches or out in the street listening. Toledo's Poles were proud of their neighborhoods, proud of their tidy houses, manicured lawns, and tight friendships. But they were proudest of their children. They saw the future in their sons and daughters and worked hard to make sure the kids would get there. Getting the education, I, you don't know how many times I heard that at home. Uh, how many times did my mom and dad say to me, are you done with your homework? You know, and, and can I help you with your homework? And it was rather interesting. My, my mother and father, their formal education virtually ended at, at eighth grade. So they really, really stressed it to us. And, and they would try to help us with our homework. And ironically, now when I look back, I knew more in the, in the seventh grade, uh, academia-wise, than my mom or dad could help me with my homework. But you know what they did? They sat there, and they, would, they played a little game. You sure that's correct? And I'd look at it, yeah, that's correct. I don't think they knew it was correct. But they wanted me to make sure that I gave it some thought before I said, yeah, that's right, and have it be wrong. Where the parents left off, their neighbors and the church picked up. And together, the entire community saw to the education of its next generation. It was very interesting. The pastor of St. Anthony's, always made sure that he kept track of all the people that were in high school to make sure that they were doing their best. So he had the grades from Notre Dame. Now, whether other schools, I don't know, but he got the grades from Notre Dame for all of us that went there. And then he would talk to us about our grades, and if he thought we could do better, he made sure that he emphasized it a little bit more than maybe it was emphasized at home. Marion Regent's family owned a dry goods store on Junction Avenue. In that store, neighborhood kids first learned how good grades could pay off. We were right across the street from the school, and a lot of the children had to walk by, and of course they bought their shoes from Dad, and um, they'd bring their grade cards in, I remember, and Dad always had suckers for them. If they had an A on their report card, they always got a sucker, so they came and my dad saw their report cards before their parents did, usually. At home and in the parish schools, one of the most important lessons Toledo's Poles taught their children was to fit in, to be proud of their heritage, but to think and speak like Americans. The first three years of my schooling, all the subjects were in Polish, whether it was arithmetic, whether it was history, whether it was uh, grammar, so we learned to speak Polish, but we, at home we always spoke English. We never spoke Polish. My dad said, be proud of your ancestry, but you're Americans now, and you have to learn how to speak English and learn how to speak it properly. So we did. As each generation got away from even from the neighborhood, uh, it became less popular to want to speak the foreign languages. And it was probably more a sign of being educated to be able to speak English. And I think that was something that was also fostered in the schools. Some of the, uh, our Polish citizens resented the fact that uh, they were teaching Polish at St. Anthony's. And when I got to be about the eighth grade, I remember some of these parents got together and said, we don't want any more Polish. It spoils the uh, language, the, the pronunciation of the English language. That good education that all of my friends received and myself ended up being the demise of the Polish neighborhood. We got such a good education, we decided there must be a better way of life, a better, higher standard of living. And as a result, we left a community that was so good to us, so kind to us. So now you go back to the Polish neighborhood and you're lucky to find five people in that neighborhood that you, you knew when you were growing up. Standing upon the foundations their parents laid down in Kuschwanz and Lagrinka, 
the newly Americanized children of immigrants could see a world of opportunity beyond the neighborhoods, and they began to strike out on their own. Ironically, for many of them, their first journeys off of LaGrange Street and Nebraska Avenue landed them back in Europe, in the trenches, fighting the demons that had driven their families to America years before. Many, many Polish immigrants heeded the call of, of you know, coming to the aid of their country. They saw World War I as the chance to rescue Poland. In 1917, before the United States had entered World War I, many of Toledo's Polish men joined General Josef Haller in a Polish volunteer army. The Haller Chiki, as they were known, fought in Europe and later against Russia, winning freedom for Poland for the first time in over a century. A generation later, when World War II ravaged Europe, Toledo's Poles again answered the call. I, I think everybody felt that they needed, we needed to help America, our new country. Because most of the people were Polish, they felt a, a terrible hurt for Poland. They were, uh, they were very sorry to hear that Poland was invaded. And I think they were glad to see that, the, uh, that their sons were able to go and, uh, and help America in this uh, war. Even if that meant facing and fighting cousins and uncles pressed into battle by the Nazis. Poland fell in, uh, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks at the most. And uh, they marched in there and they just took over and they, they gave the Polish the people their choice. You either, you and your family go to concentration camp or you can join us as a fighter. I know when I took these prisoners, and especially this year when, when this one Polish prisoner came out, he's holding his crucifix in his hand, it was around his neck, he's, he kept hollering, me Polak, me Polak, meaning I'm Polish, I'm Polish, you know, see. So, uh, well, we marched him over to the, to the uh, company headquarters, you know, Company E, and I told Kirk Patrick, I said, well, five of these prisoners are Polish. He said, what the hell's the difference? He said, they were just shooting at you in a, in a, a minute ago. He said, what difference does it make what nationality they are? So if they're Polish, we're supposed to let them go? When the war ended and Toledo's Polish soldiers came home, they were no longer Poles living in America. They had fought and some had died for their adopted country. And now they had become Polish Americans. They moved beyond the confines of Kuszwans and Lagrinka and began to exercise their influence. Some became active in politics, and names like Chalusta, Walensky, and Piotrkowski, formerly associated with corner stores, social organizations, and the parish church, took on new meanings. I would be in a room of people to address them or meet them or, or whatever the event might have been, and, and invariably there was usually someone in the room who would have uh, known my great uncle, the pastor, or my grandfather, the pharmacist, and would have a story, and it was a wonderful way to, to break the ice and, and to meet people and also to learn a little bit about them. I found they knew a lot more about me than I knew about them, which, which, was, a, which was a very interesting. And no matter how far Toledo's Polish politicians run, even all the way to Washington, they find that the distance back to Kuszwans and Lagrinka is a short one especially in the memories of their supporters. My Uncle Martin owned some land on Hill and Wentz Road, and they had, during the 1930s, they had a place they called the Dugout, which must have been underground, and it was actually a brewery. And so people would go there during the um, era when prohibition uh, was imposed in the country, and they'd drink beer, and one day the place blew up. And when I would tell audiences about this, when I was running for office, I thought, well, no one will know about this. Everybody laughed. They all knew it because they'd been there, which I thought was hilarious. In some ways, it puts a lot more pressure on you because there's already been uh, people ahead of you uh, who have already performed, really done a wonderful service to the community, and you're expected to do at least that much. So. Uh, and at times, uh, it, it, can be, it can be considered a burden. I don't look at it that way. I think it's a wonderful way to, to continue a tradition. By the end of World War II, Toledo's Poles had realized the American dream. 
they started to leave their Polish neighborhoods and move into new homes and new lives across Toledo. So today the Polish community is a community in spirit rather than a list of street addresses. It's held together now by heritage and tradition. Polish is not taught at St. Hedwig's anymore, uh, in, um, but still uh, the customs and traditions, we, we try to keep them up and um, uh, have the, uh, the youngsters uh, know something about them and, uh, and treasure them. One of the nice things is the uh, annual Corpus Christi procession. Uh, it goes from St. Adalbert's to St. Hedwig's or uh, vice versa on uh, alternate years with stops uh, in the neighborhood um, at four different homes and readings from the gospel at each home and people along the way de decorate their homes and uh, uh, people who have ethnic costumes uh, wear them and uh, it's a very uh, lovely uh, procession in the springtime. And then there's the music. Wherever they may be, Toledo's Polish-Americans can still be brought right back to the neighborhoods by the city's traditional musicians. From the echoes of Poland dancers, to the Polish-American concert band, my Jaja in Polish, uh, came to America in about 1912-1913. Um, and uh, they, they settled in the Toledo area. Uh, my Jaja was a was the director of the, the Polish Army Band, a fantastic musician. And when he came to uh, the Toledo area, there were a group of uh, musicians that were, were playing in the area, and not very formally. And when my Jaja came here, he kind of got the band together and, uh, and formalized it a little bit, I guess you could say that. And uh, that was the beginnings, the infancy really of uh, what, what we have today as a Polish-American concert band. Back in the days uh, before my time, the band would play a number of the parades uh, on the LaGrange Street area or, or in the Kuschmans area too, as a matter of fact. Uh, it was uh, uh, the Silver Cornet Band, the White Eagles Band. Um, the uh, Polish Falcons Band, the uh, P&A Band, and certainly now the Polish American Concert Band. So that had undergone a number of names, again, depending on where uh, the band uh, practiced primarily. My father was uh, also a member of the band. He was a clarinet player and a very, very fine clarinet player. Um, I have been a member of the band for quite a few years myself. I play clarinet also, and um, eventually then became director of the band. And, uh, and my son is also a clarinet player, and he's a member of the band also. So we have like four generations of uh, the Maczkiewiczs. Jim's family has four generations in it. I'm the third of three generations in there, and then we have uh, the Bachers. They have three generations in it, and that's where we get the, the tradition. We try to keep up the spirit of the Polish neighborhood, uh, the Polish community, by playing a lot of the, some of the music that we play. and. Uh, uh, we think we contribute that way to the neighborhood and that's something I think the neighborhood should be proud of, uh, to have a band like this. Poland's music still echoes in Toledo, as rich and varied as ever. The Polish-American concert band and Echoes of Poland keep it alive on stage, while Chet Zablocki plays polkas on the radio. There was a polka show on, and it was run by an uh, elderly, gen elderly gentleman from uh, Buffalo. But he got ill, and he passed away, so there was a show open. But anyway, a couple of friends of mine and my wife, they thought, man, I would like it on a bet. Well, try it. See what happens. Well, that was uh, April 13, 1947, a half-hour radio show. Well, and then we went to 10 years, and 20, and 30, and 40, and will it ever stop? What may bind Toledo's Poles most tightly to their roots is neither church nor music, though it has ties to both. When they need a touchstone or want to celebrate their heritage, 
Toledo's Poles return to the Polish grocery and stand in line. I don't want to discourage anybody, but, you know, we have them three, four deep here. And um, as I say, we have added help, and it expedites things pretty good. Seems like people eat kielbasa for every holiday. Probably we go through about uh, 15 ton over the holiday season. We make um, pierogi and um, potato pancakes, chardina, but kielbasa is the number one. Christmas and Easter is very busy. Very busy. They come. Everybody comes just about. They don't want to make it at home, so they come out and, and they uh, buy it, and then maybe they tell their husbands they make it. I don't know, but that's the way it works out. The Polish immigrants who settled in Kuszwans and Lagrinka sought new lives in America, but longed for the familiarity of their homeland. They found both. The neighborhoods harbored them, nurtured them, and set them on a path to prosperity that helped build the city. The neighborhoods aren't quite the same anymore. Toledo's Polish Americans are more likely to be found in the suburbs than on the streets around St. Hedwig's or St. Anthony's. But wherever they are, they keep Lagrinka and Kuszwans in their hearts, and they are always ready to return, if only briefly, to the sights, the smells, the sounds of the old neighborhoods just one more time. There's, there's a great deal I miss about the neighborhood. It's hard to differentiate what one misses about the neighborhood from what one is nostalgic about as a child. But um, there was uh, uh, a security, um, a neighborliness, uh, and most notably, uh, a cleanliness about that Polish neighborhood that um, it still stands out in my mind. Polonia, that has its roots on LaGrange, that has its roots on Nebraska, is everywhere. It's infiltrated the whole city, and it has intermarried. It has crossed uh, cultural lines, cultural boundaries, and hopefully the good things of it will endure, and, and I'm sure they will because um, they're so very positive that uh, there wouldn't be any way that they couldn't. Well, you, you had to always go back where your roots started. Uh, I was born there, and uh, especially when I drive by the, there's, a, there's a grocery store on Buckingham, Marcheski's Market, I usually go there to pick up my holiday stuff, and then I in the neighborhood, so I drive by my home, and I drive by my store where I used to have it, and then see all that, and just wishing that turn the clock back 50 years and be there again, and remember all the good memories there. We're here with Jim Marshall, manager of the local history room of the Little Lucas County Public Library. Jim, I've heard in the past few years, maybe a decade or more, that there's been a real explosion in interest in genealogy and family history. Have you, have you seen that happening? Definitely. Um, I think it's attributed to a couple of things. One thing, of course, was the miniseries Roots. Okay. That had a great impression on a number of people. Um, the second thing, I think, is the ability now to, um, to, to publish, that it's very easy, desktop publishing, mm -hmm. and the Internet. Uh, those those things, those three elements have, have played a great part in, in really making people interested and bringing them in. Mm -hmm. what, what do people hope to find? I mean, what do people come here to find when they're researching their family history? Generally, they only have a hazy idea about their great-grandparents mm -hmm. and, and subsequent uh, ancestors. Um, they're, they're looking for uh, information where they lived, who they were, what kind of lives they lived, and what kind of people they were. Mm -hmm. what, what can they expect to find? I mean, when they walk through your doors, what, 
what can they expect really to, to find and discover here? Well, I think if they keep in mind that um, we don't have everything and that no one has everything mm -hmm. and that it takes a long time sometimes to do the research. People work weeks, months, years mm -hmm. trying to find some of this information. But we have a strong collection for the states east of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. We have a strong colonial collection, and of course we have a, a great collection of Ohio and local Toledo material. So if their interest is there, they should start here, and it's uh, possible that they may find some things, particularly if it's a local Toledo connection. The odds are very good that we're going to have information. Mm -hmm. What should they bring with them? Well, they should bring in as much information as they can find about the people they're looking for. Their best bet is probably to talk to as many family members as they can. Mm -hmm. So obviously, the earlier you start on a project like this, the better off you're going to be. Mm -hmm. If you can talk to great aunts, mothers, grandmothers, great uncles, and find out as much as you can, write that down and then come in with questions about the people you're looking for. If you can phrase what you're looking for in a question, then it's easy for us to point you in a direction or to get you an answer. Mm -hmm. Now, how do people usually get started once they arrive? And what, what particular things do they look at? The, the f first things, I think, are the initially are the easiest things. The obituary index, if mm -hmm. they're looking for people in Toledo. The obituary index begins in 1835 and goes to present day. Mm -hmm. There's a very good chance there may be an obituary. There are death records very early on, um, health department death records that they can look at. There are city directories from 1858 forward, and then there is the census information for Ohio, which would include Lucas County and Toledo, um, and uh, we have it for Michigan also and some other states, but that will begin um, as early as 1820 and go to 1930. Mm -hmm. and is a great source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you done your own genealogy? I've done some, but obviously I don't have much time <laughs> since I'm helping everyone else. <laughs> right, right, good. What, what are some of the greatest discoveries that you've seen people achieve here? Um, there have been many times when people will, will yell out Eureka. Um, <laughs> sometimes it brings tears to their eyes when they mm -hmm. find something that is memorable about a, a grandparent or, or sometimes even a mother or a father. We have yearbooks from the very beginning oh, that must be uh, really to fun. present day, mm -hmm. and that's one of our most popular things. And people will be looking for pictures of people and often find them in the yearbooks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're just looking at Toledo families, I suppose there's quite a bit of, of published information. You don't necessarily have to go into the manuscripts and the records. Is that, is that true? Uh, yes. There would be published obituaries um, in many cases. We have a name index, which you can check, and mm -hmm. oftentimes you'll find information published either in early histories of the county or in newspaper articles that have been saved, mm -hmm. um, either for this area or, or from Ohio or from outside of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So there, there are published records that you may find people in. Mm -hmm. What if uh, your family spoke a foreign language and those records possibly could be misspelled or names can get changed. Yes, yes. It, interestingly, we, we take it for granted that the spelling is remaining the same, and of course it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Prior to the Second War and prior to Social Security, people changed the, the, the way they spelled their name through the course of their life. The other thing was, it often was spelled by an enumerator or whoever was taking it down mm -hmm. phonetically. Mm -hmm. So that is something you have to be very careful of and look for variant spellings. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, now, I know that the new census of 1930 just came out. What, what sort of uh, additions does that, does that make? Well, it, it adds another 10 years, which is great. I mean, people have been looking for that 1930 census. Because 1930 um, isn't all that long ago, but there mm -hmm. are people who uh, first come to this country after uh, 1920, and they're trying to find them for the first time here. Um, it is a, a, a tremendous resource since it tells you who is the head of the household, who is living in the household and their ages, and where they were born and where their parents were born. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I understand that the census restricts access to its records for, what, 72 70 years? 72 mm -hmm. years. And uh, once that time period has, has, has uh, expired, then you can look at the actual manuscript, the actual, the actual record, record That's for correct. the family. Yes. It, presently, it's, it's available uh, on microfilm but it's only available through 1930. Okay. 72 years after 1930, the 1940 census will be released. And that is done so that the census 
uh, can be taken with people feeling rather comfortable about giving the information, mm -hmm. knowing that it's not going to be available publicly uh, in terms of the actual person uh, for 72 years. The count is, is taken, the and count, we know how right. many people, and we know the answers to those kinds of statistical information that's compiled, but you're not going to be able to see the 1940 census. We'll have to wait. Yes. Now, uh, tell me about some of the particular, the most useful resources people normally consult as they, as they come in during family research. Well, as they come in, uh, the name index, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. is probably the first thing that they should check. Um, just to see what is there and mm -hmm. to show us the card so we can retrieve the information. The obituary index is another great resource and they should check that. Mm -hmm. um, we have a large manuscript collection and that is indexed uh, by name in the, in the name index. There could be uh, documents or some kind of information pertaining to, to their family. The county histories are arranged by county after the uh, city directories at the beginning and then the county histories so they could browse a particular county in Ohio. Um, and those normally have indexes to family names and, and so forth? Uh, uh, normally they have indexes and the information will include uh, parish records, um, it could be transcriptions of cemeteries, uh, it, it may be any kind of genealogical things that the local genealogical chapters have published, and it can be histories that have been published on that particular county. Then after that, there are uh, state census indexes in book form. Mm -hmm. Then after that is the general geneal genealogical collection, at the end of which are the family histories. Keeping in mind that about 40% of the material is out here on the shelves, and there's a large amount of material that is in stack areas including photographs, oral histories, maps, things like that, and books. Terrific. Thanks, Jim. We've been speaking with Jim Marshall, manager of the local history room of the Tittle Lucas County Public Library. And if you want to learn more about how to research a family history or find out more about Tittle history, you can go to the Tittle's Attic website, which contains a lot of links and information about local history generally. Or you can go to the Tittle Lucas County Public Library website, which contains a lot of information about local history, local photographs, and of course, the all-important library catalog is there as well. Finally, you can also look for more resources on the WGTE.org website, where many of these other links are archived. We'll visit the WGTE film and video archives after this look at Toledo, then and now. Now we'll leave you with a trip through the vaults of the WGTE film and video archives, which contain donated photographic images, rare film footage, and video that documents many pivotal moments in Toledo's history. The archives also hold vintage commercial messages from long lost Toledo businesses. Enjoy this look back at the golden age of television. I'm Timothy Messer Cruz for Toledo Stories. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time. The car's never been dirtier, and just the day you have an important engagement. No time now to blame the man of the house, so the thing to do is to drive to Doc's Minute Wash at 714 Huron Street, just off Cherry, where it takes only a minute to wash a car even as dirty as this one. Doc's Minute Wash is complete, starting with a thorough vacuum cleaning of the interior of the car, getting out all the dirt and dust that's so hard on clothes. Then, the car rolls down the ramp for a preliminary soaping to loosen road dirt and grime. Doc's men wear soft cotton wash gloves and use a special soap that loosens dirt safely. Now, the car enters the soft minute wash brushes where 24 streams of water flow over the car, rinsing off all soap and dirt. Most important to how a car looks after washing is the way it's dried. Drying streaks are eliminated by warm air blowers, which evaporate the clean rinse water as the men polish the finish with clean, soft towels. And there it is. Not just half washed and half dried, but completely washed and dried. It took just a minute at Doc's Minute Wash, 714 Huron Street, just off Cherry. A dollar twenty-five cent on weekdays and a dollar and a half on Sundays.
A video of the program you've just seen is available for $19.95. You can visit us online at WGTE.org or call us at 419-380-4613. To learn more about the history of Northwest Ohio, visit Toledo Stories online at WGTE.org. Explore a wealth of resources, including books on each program subject, internet sites, and interesting places to visit in our area. The presentation of Toledo Stories is made possible in part by Key Bank, celebrating the strength of our region's history and supporting the promise of its future. Key Bank, achieve anything. And by the generous financial support of viewers like you, Thank you. that it became known as Lagrinka. In Lagrinka, the Poles built a home that had everything they needed. You would never had to leave the community to, to satisfy you. When I got to be about the eight